Hey there, welcome in this new episode of X-State in the Wild. Today, we are going to talk about ZACGS with its creator, Segun Adebayo. ZACGS is a JavaScript library to create your own accessible components. It comes with many primitives and is powered by state machines. It uses a syntax similar to the syntax of X-State to define its state machines. It's framework agnostic, and you can use it with React, Solid, or Vue.js. If one day you want to create a number input, I invite you to use ZACGS. You can import the number input package from ZACGS. It gives you this machine function. The number input dot machine function returns a state machine, and you can create an instance from this state machine with the use machine hook. The hook comes from ZACGS React, in my case, but if you use Solid, it will come from ZACGS Solid, or if you use Vue.js, it will come from ZACGS Vue.js. So you can see that ZACGS is framework agnostic, the state machine will remain the same, but the hook to wire the state machine to your framework will be dependent on the framework you use. Then, the use machine hook returns a state and a send function, but you don't use these properties by yourself. You use the number input.connect function. This function takes the state and the send function and returns an API. The API gives you, for instance, these get root props, get label props, get decrement trigger props, etc. So the API gives you simpler function to work with than um, the state machine itself. ZACGS doesn't come with any style, but it gives you primitives to create good and accessible components. For instance, the input we talked about, you can press the arrow up key or the arrow down key to increment or decrement um, the input. I didn't cut that, it's implemented inside of the state machine of ZACGS. You can click on the buttons. So all the behavior is handled by ZACGS and it's up to you to create your components for your design system and style them however you want. Now let's talk with Segun about this excellent library. Maybe uh, Edge, you can present you a bit. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Shagun Adebayo. You can call me Sage. Um, I've, I mean, for the past couple of years, I've been working on developer tools, uh, ranging from Chakra UI to ZACJS to Panda CSS, RQI. Quite a mouthful now. I mean, after maybe five, six years working in open source. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be here um, to talk about ZACJS and state machine stuff. I geek about these things every day, so I'm happy to talk about it again. Great. So when did when did you start working on uh, ZACGS? Uh yeah, I mean I think that's like 2021, 2020, 2021, roughly. Um so I think 2020 was when I struggled with X State. Um I just like during the COVID time, like where everyone was like at home. Um, I just spent all my time just watching about watching X State. Um I mean from the front end masters course. Um, I, I think I watched it twice and it's like, <laughs> I, I did the same. Sure. <laughs> I did the same. <laughs> I'm not sure I get, I'm not sure I get this thing. It feels a bit too complex for me. Um, but I think like slowly, um, I mean, it's, it's amazing how the brain works, right? Like after you do it once, twice, somehow the connections start to make sense. And, um, then around 2021, um, I started to actually build the first, um, the first state machine, which was an accordion. Um, just try it out. Like, this is Chakra UI. This is like a state machine. Let me try to make it match one to one. Um, but using state machines instead, right? So I, I got the hang of it. Still a little bit clunky for my liking. Um, to be honest. Uh, but then I just like, after I built it again, I did it once and I did it again. It made sense. And I think from there on, I started to feel like, I was ready to actually be, I mean, build with X state. So to be honest, it started with like, I want to build with X state, not like ZACJS, I mean, to be honest. 
Uh, but I think as I went down the XTBV4 path, um, I mean, a couple of things were already like immediately obvious. Some of the patterns that you were able to do inside of the components in React, I wasn't really able to pull it off um, because XTB is very like, it's a very explicit system. We model it and it's pretty explicit, right? Um, and a lot of things in React is not exactly like X state in that sense. So like the way effects work in React where their dependencies, when the dependencies change, the effects would run and you can control and do uncontrolled components. A lot of things in React that is very interesting. Um, right. So those things were quite challenging to solve in X state. So I decided to like figure out like, and also X state was primarily based on React, right? So like the view and solid JS versions were not too fully fleshed out. In that sense, so I, I decided to figure out, like, I mean, how can I solve this problem? Um, I, again, also making this smaller library because I think x v 4 was quite on the big size. Um, so I wanted to actually just trim it down, create a very minimal version of x state, um, and sort of leave with that for a while. So I've been on that, and it's been pretty, pretty awesome so far. Okay. And did you start working on uh, ZegJS to solve the problem? Uh, that you had at Chakra UI, or was it totally independent? Um, yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, I, the, the main goal was to solve the problem in Chakra UI, but I wasn't aware of it at the time. Like, I just wanted to, I mean, it just felt like a cool new thing to learn. Okay. Um, that's how we started, to be honest. And then I think while the second time after I watched the front end master's course, uh, it then made sense like, hmm, I could actually use this stuff to build Chakra UI. Um, instead of like just then for fun, right? So then it became like, okay, now this is serious. I, I have to take it seriously, not just like um, do it for fun. So I, I spent the next year after that just like digging into the, I mean, the state charts, white paper, reading about it, trying to learn about like the core details, read the SCXML um, specification on W3C website, like tr just like get all these things inside you so you can actually like build something serious um so from there on actually then i had the goal to build chakra with it um, see how far i can go i think i mean to be honest i didn't believe it was possible when i started but i think the more i went on the more i was convinced that this this thing can work out okay and did you know about state machines prior to discovering uh, x state during that period nope okay I mean, the, 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 I, the most I knew at that time was reducers. I mean, I could create a reducer function to do all sorts of things based on state and action, but like using the core concept of like your states, transitions, events, no, nothing of those. I mean, it's just Redux. Everyone knows Redux and some reducer. That's all I knew. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I discovered the state, I think, at the same uh, uh, during the COVID. And Yes, the, the course of David Gorshid on Frontend Masters, I loved it. Um, oh, nice. He did, uh, I think, several courses, one for just X-State and one for React plus uh, X-State. Yes, uh, I watched both. Uh, they were they were very instructive and learned many things about state machines, X-State. I also gave a look uh, to the STXML uh, documentation. So X-State is based on some theoretical um, foundations. I, I think we can mm -hmm. tell uh, this way. So uh, SXML is a specification that many libraries can implement and XState implemented. So uh, many SXML compliant libraries should be compatible between each other. This was the base yeah. principle of XState uh, uh, as far as understood at this, uh, at this time. And- um, Yeah, totally. So uh, to maybe to clarify, uh, in ZaxJS you don't use X state, you forked it in 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 a way, and uh, choose to to rebuild X state uh, for your uh, own requirements. Is it right? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe I will not put it like that because it okay. feels like I mean you're just trying to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> um, like, what's the point of trying to rebuild something that already exists? Right, that's the feeling you get. Uh, but I think the, the thought was like, I really wanted like just a small, a smaller footprint of X state. So I took the X state at the time there was this X state slash FSM library, right? So that library on NPM is like a three kilobytes, I think, implementation of X state still by the X state theme, still made by the X state guys as well, right? So 
I took that library and I started to see, okay, what can I build with this smaller version of the library? Because I was looking for a smaller footprint. Um, and it couldn't, it, I mean, it wasn't as feature rich as the actual X state itself, right? So I, I, so what I started to do was like, I started with that one as the base and I started to add back all the stuff that I wanted from X state. And then it felt like you are really remaking X state again. Um, so I'm just like, no, I'm not going to do this, um, this approach instead, right? And as, of course, there's this pattern in X state where you have to like, I mean, everything has to be pure. Yeah. I mean, if you want to set context, you have to like, create a new object and spread it in, right? So that really, of course, that, that concept of purity came from React, right? So if you want to create a new set of state, you have to set a new one or create a copy. But I mean, as much as that was convenient, I just really liked the Vue.js model of things, where it's like, I mean, you just assign the value and everything just worked, right? So I liked the, uh, I saw I liked the developer experience of the Vue reactivity system. Right. So, and I wanted to see like, okay, I mean, it just feels nice. If you have some state and you want to set some value, you just assign it and it's done. I think Svelte also has this pattern as well. Um, so I wanted to just like get the DX of that. Um, but with the same theories and ideas as X state and state charts in general. Right. So those were the things I took out. Um, and just like tried to like add my own little spice on top of it, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Because XState has many advanced features like parallel states, um, spawning, invoking. Do you do you need all of this to implement uh, ZXJS? No, nope. I mean you don't even need. I, th I think you probably don't need maybe you probably need maybe only twenty percent of the things in XState to build ZXJS or to build any component with ZXJS, right? So it's not you don't need the whole shenanigans. We don't have nested states. Okay. We have the concept of spawning, but just a very basic one. Um, but then the main thing is just like the context, the, um, the states, the transitions, the activities, which is now called actors. Um, so those kind of things, that's, that's all you need. You, you don't want to do too many. I mean, I think the component, when you're trying to build a component, the, the logic is not too crazy, right? It's not, you're not trying to build a whole complex electronic system or something. So it's just a very fairly simple thing. Um, so you don't need too many things to get that done. You know? Great. Maybe we can give uh, some examples of uh, components uh, available in ZXJS. Uh, you talked about Accordion. Maybe there are other components on top of your mind. Uh, Oh yeah, of course. I mean, we've gone really with like full blown right now. We've got date picker, we've got color picker, okay. we've got menus, nested menus, combo box, autocomplete. Um, so those kind of things, we have modeled them all as state charts, right? And the good part of that is a state chart is just a vanilla JS implementation. So you can take that and integrate that in React, in Vue, in okay. Solid. I mean, even now we are playing with Quick as well. So you can take that and put it in Quick and it works as well. So it's kind of like, experimenting with all these different ways of distributing the same state charts. I think that is something we don't see enough of. Like we, we hear and we hear about the concept of state charts. It sounds nice, but we actually don't see it working in our own framework, right? We want to actually see it working in our framework of choice, uh, which is what ZGS is trying to do. Okay. So ZGS is some state machines for, for components. And then if you want to wire those state machines, to your framework, how do you do that? Um, yeah, so every framework has like a reactivity layer, right? So React has some state, some reactive primitives, right? So I, I mean, those are like use state, use effect, use reducer. I mean, so a lot of the time, I mean, this the state machine itself could be considered like an external system, right? And React is awesome because it gives you a hook called use sync external store. So you could take that hook and actually just like sync up the state of your machine with React in that sense. Of course, you have to do some render optimizations in there, but that's just React. I mean, other frameworks are pretty good on their own because they use the concept of signals, right? So you can take something like VJS or Solid, create a signal, I mean, within an effect, sync that up with the, the framework itself. And you don't have to think about the rendering and all of the things, right? But with React, you have to take care of these little neat bits. Um, but I think we have like a, we, we, ZagJS ships like a small package for each framework, which is pretty much just like a, some sort of use effect and use state 
type of hook in every framework, right? So, so you so you don't have to think about this integration. You just take the machine, put it into the framework layer, um, and then you're good to go. It just works. Great. And um, what do the state machine implement? Um, so you are talking about accordions. So I think the the state machine handle some events like clicking uh, somewhere on the component. Um, does it provide uh, something else like styles or uh, I don't know uh, something else? Uh, no, not not really. So I think the so what what, we, what it does is just like we. So if you if you look at I think one one of the most interesting things we can maybe take a look at I'm happy to share my screen at some point is like there's this there's this website called like the Aria APG which is the authoring practices for most for common components right now if you read like if you if you read one of these guides so let's say you want to make like a let's see say like an accordion component like you said. Now, if you read the spec of that, it literally reads like a state machine. Um, like, I mean, if it's in this state, you can do this and that. If it's in that one, you can do this and that. Um, but of course, we a lot of the time we take that and maybe just implement it in React and we're done. But because it reads like a state chart, it's pretty much like I mean, it's just there. Like, it's it's just so sweet to take that and put that in some state machine, and uh, you're pretty much good to go. So. Yeah, we, we follow this kind of like specs um, to just like, I mean, we don't follow it to, to the letter. We try to test it and figure out if it makes sense um, to do that. But a lot of the time, this machine maps to that spec. Um, and then, of course, on top of that, I provide just like other methods that may be helpful to the developer. Right. So if you say like the, I mean, for the accordion, if you want to programmatically open an accordion, Right. Of course, the spec is not going to tell you that, but it's just you that you have to figure out. Like at some point, the developer will want to programmatically do stuff or interact with this accordion, and I don't want them to learn state machines because that's a bit too much for them. So what I can do is to expose a function, okay. like maybe open an accordion. So like you say, pass the value of the accordion you want to open, and it's going to open. Right. So those are the things you have to think about. Um, just the developer experience of interacting with the state machine. Right, so building the state machine is nice. It's just like building the engine of a car, but you're never really exposed to the engine at any point. You just put some nice fancy stuff on it, and people are, people are happy to drive it, put a fancy seat, you know. Right, so that's pretty much how we think about building components. Yeah. Okay, so state machines are actually just a small part of ZXJS, and then you add some, uh, I think, accessibility layer, and then. Um, I don't know an API to to let uh, developers API, uh, um, interact with it. Correct, exactly. Okay, and so we talked about an accordion component. Uh, I saw in the on the documentation of the GS that there is um, a button component. Um, my question is: I understand as a Nick state uh, lover that state machine solve um, complex problems way more easily than uh, other solutions. But my question is, yeah. uh, does it feel necessary to use state machines for smaller components? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I, to be honest, I mean, a state machine is not like a silver bullet for anything. You don't just take it all and slap a state machine on it and see, I'm going to solve it. Yeah, of course, there's the temp I have to say there's the bias to want to use a state machine to solve everything. Um, but I mean, it's not so bad in itself. I mean, I would say, so like a state machine can have states. I mean, and a state machine could also be used as a pure reducer, right? It's just take something and set some states. It's not doing any state transition. Um, of course, I mean, so you could think of it like just a store, right? So at the, at the, at the lowest level, you can raise the argument that a state machine could also be a store. There's some context information, some events that you have to explicitly send to update that store. That is the cleaner system you can ever have, at least. So the, you can make that argument, to be honest. Even if it's a small thing, you can always use a state machine for that. <laughs> uh, but of course, the counter argument to that is like, with something that's fairly like extremely simple to do, like just you just want to set is pressed true or false. Like, no, you don't need a state machine for that. Like, you just, I mean, just create some state primitive, use the state primitives of your framework to do that, right? But when it gets a bit complex, um, then you have to, I mean, when it states, when it feels like you start to do like 
I mean, I mean, it's open and it's expanded, and you start to actually like have multiple states that you have to coordinate together. And then it becomes very clear that okay, there's some states, states and transitions here that I need to think about. Um, of course, I mean, a classic React developer would not think of this. It's just like go in a use effect and sw- just like do all the jamboree there and make sure it works um, and you're done. But I think. Someone, I mean, a true engineer would think about that and see this. There's actually like a um, some sort of like state and transition thing we need to think about here. And you don't have to use a library. You just have to figure out like create an object of all the states and figure out like how do you want to transition between them. It's just a way of thinking. Not really like state machine is not equal to x state yes. in that sense. It's it's just like a way of thinking about problems and solving problems, right? So that's. That's my own take. So I have just two brains. I mean, there's one part of my brain that feels like, uh, yeah, you could technically do that if you want, but at the same time, you have to be more pragmatic and figure like, you don't have to every time, yeah. Yes, I love the, this explanation. And you were giving the argument that maybe you could use X state for every problem and it could replace, uh, for instance, the stand or Jote, uh, which are libraries, uh, Stores mm. libraries, Xstate does that. We can use yeah, Xstate too. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, I love that you you mentioned that state machines are not Xstate. Thinking in state machines is, I think, more important than learning uh, Xstate. Uh, you can use uh, state machines in other languages than JavaScript. Xstate is just yeah. for JavaScript. But yes, I think one re- really cool thing is to learn thinking about state machines, state transitions. So I'm in this state, what can happen, etc. And totally. I have another question for you. How many people did contribute to ZagJS, all the machines for the components uh, we, we mentioned? Yeah, I mean, I think we maybe just like two people. Um, in general, that's me and another core maintainer, Abraham. So we pretty much just like work on work on it. Um, Abraham is still sort of growing in that process. I'm helping him out, just like helping him to learn about like the um, the details. Um, and he's building out really cool stuff. I mean, very recently he, he worked on a virtualization library um, with uh, with state machines, oh. and he also worked on like a, an audio player. Uh, so it's kind of like a pretty cool thing you could do uh, with, with state machines, uh, right? So it's so starting to build some more confidence um, to contribute in there. Uh, well, I'd say like a large chunk, say 80% of the machines, I built them myself. Um, and then of course, we are starting to also see external contributors. Maybe one person creates one simple machine. Um, I mean, it always ends up being complex, even though it starts simple. <laughs> but I'm glad we have like state machines. So like I, I help them sort of deconstruct the complexity and make the things work a bit more. Yeah. Okay. And did some people um, tell you that state machines are too complex, overkill, and maybe you should uh, do things another way? Uh, this is something we hear about state machines that, no, you don't need them. Uh, I understand my use effects. I know how to code with this effect, uh, no need for state machines. Yeah, I mean, of course people do that. I mean, I think it's, it's a very common thing. Like if you're not, if a, if a concept is foreign to you, I mean, there's a very innate bias that you just want to talk down on it. Like, nah, it's not useful. I don't need it. I think even all the way back to like when React was introduced and JSX was introduced, <laughs> everybody's like, what is this? It's not so great. Like, why do I have to do this? Right. So it's, <laughs> I mean, I think it's just human behavior in general, right? So, I mean, I don't, I don't consider it's like someone does not like state machines. I think there's a level of complexity you get to that there's no other two that can solve this besides state machines. Otherwise, you just end up in chaos and regressions everywhere, right? So, it's you don't, you don't have to start with state machines. Of course, I have to say that. Like, just use your your, your library primitives and you're fine. But the problem starts to grow, especially if you work within a company and you're building a product, the complexity of your product grows exponentially, right? So from next week, from this week to next week to next month, the complexity grows. It just grows in a massive way. And you have to be able to tame that complexity in a way that can be easily maintained. Otherwise, you've just built a, a robot, or a huge a huge beast that no one can work with, right? So it's... 
it's something that you come to realize over time. So people initially don't feel comfortable with it. I think it's also kind of also means that like even the state machine, people that like preach about state machines would also kind of like, I mean, in that sense, I mean, just how, I mean, make it look a bit more sexy. I think that's the way I can put it. Like, just let's not make it look a bit too mechanical and too structural and all these terminologies we throw around. All right. So it's just like if you, you, and when someone buys a car, you don't want to just introduce the engine or the chassis to them. Like, I mean, that's a bit too much, right? So like, they're, they're not engineers to know the engine oil and all the specs. Like, they don't care about that until there's an engine failure. Then they care about what's going on, right? So it's that's sound like the way I see it as well, like a progressive disclosure of knowledge, um, so that people don't just like, they're not exposed to the entire machine. We may build some API around it. It looks nice. Everyone can use it within the company, and they love it and it's consistent. People are happy. And when there's a problem, you say it's a quick fix. It's easy because all of the states and everything is explicit. I think people start to like it a bit more um, uh, compared to the classic way of doing things. So I think those are huge benefits. So I think people should see the benefits before they embrace this old idea of state machines in the first place here. Yeah, yeah that, that was the topic I, I wanted to talk about, updating state machines. So you mentioned that you follow some specifications for accessibility. Do this specification change often or not? Usually they don't change, okay. I mean, it's just like the it's just like the HTML standards as well. Like they don't they don't really change. If they change, they change once in like three four years, and that's fine. I mean that's enough time to do a breaking change again. Okay. Uh, so and technically it's usually not a breaking change. It's just like an improvement in accessibility or stuff like this. So I mean a, a select element has not broken since how many years? So it's like it's literally the same. Um, if you wrote HTML in 1990 and now it's still the select is still the select, right? It will look different, of course, but it's still the same way and it works the same. And that's why I like it because every element in that you're designing for has a fixed set of interactions and a fixed set of APIs in that sense. So that's why I think a state machine is just the best representation of that, right? So, and that's kind of like the way it works. And, and when it comes to managing changes inside the machine itself, which is why I prefer like to always do like, I mean, an API around that, right? So it's kind of like, you don't give people the state machine to interact with directly, okay. but you design an API around that such that, I mean, you can change the system, but the API still stays the same, right? I think that's really where the benefit is. All right, so like, I mean, even, I always like to use the a classic example of a vehicle or a car, right? Because like, I can literally replace a, a whole part of a car in the engine and it still works the same way for you. Like all that you care about is once I put my key and it turns on, I'm ready to drive. Like that's all I need to know. Right? I don't care whether you change the exhaust pipes or something, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's really the way I think about it as well. Um, an API around it and you should be good to go. Okay. So the state machine you implemented at the beginning of uh, the Jess didn't change a lot, uh, if I understand well. Yeah, it didn't change a lot. Of course, we probably, most of the time, we, we, we rarely change it, except if there's really a bug. There's something that doesn't work, then of course we fix it um, and we improve it. And the, the great part about that is once you, once you improve it or fix something, it propagates to everyone, right? Like everyone in every framework enjoys that benefit. Um, as opposed to repeating that work over and over and over again across multiple frameworks. Like that is crazy work I cannot do. I don't have the lifespan for at least. I think it's a great transition to talk about the future of uh, ZACGS. What uh, will, uh, will it begin, uh, start, to, uh, start to be in the future? I mean, it's really hard because like right now, um, I mean, to, to be honest, I would say like the future of of something like ZagJS already is kind of like already in progress, um, which is like Arc, RQI, um, what we currently have. Right? So RQI is pretty much like making like the nice body of a color. Like we just like take the thing and just like put a nice shape around it and just like say, hey, just use that. Um, and the, the I think the main goal, what we wanted to achieve with RQI is I mean, if you see the code in React and you see the code in Solid and you see the code in Vue, the only thing that changes 
90% is the same. Maybe only 10, 5, 10% will change, but the code literally looks exactly the same way. All right. And that is, that is the, I would say that's like the ultimate for the ultimate form of like a component library. One, I can use it in multiple frameworks, right? If I don't feel like using React today and I want to use SolidJS, I don't feel constrained because there's no component library in SolidJS and there's way too many component libraries in React. So people are forced to like pick React because of this um, reason, but maybe they prefer Solid or Vue.js. I mean, they just want to try it out and see how it feels. So providing the same experience I mean, across board in every framework that's really the future we, we, I mean, we hope that ZachJS could get to, but we already achieved that. So that's like awesome. Um, so RQI already exists today. You can install it in at least three major frameworks, right? So I, I would say like, I mean, with the, with the rise of like new systems, like the AI and all of the like V0 tools where you can actually scaffold the component. I mean, of course, the future that I see there would be like be, being able to actually like build complex UIs. I mean, whether simple or complex UIs using all the primitives we provide in ZachJS, right? So you don't, you just have to say, build me a dashboard and it's gonna like, I mean, use all of the like primitives that we provide in our QI. Um, and it, whatever, in whatever framework you choose, I think that's the real beauty of it. So it's like, I can get like the state machines or our QI in that sense in React, Vue and Solid. And my dashboard works the same. Like it doesn't change um, regardless of the framework because today, all of these tools are kind of like either baked in React or baked in, I think React is the most common one. So it's like even any even any AI system or LLM today is kind of still React centric, right? Not, not, it takes a while for them to get to view or solid, but with RQI, we actually have, I mean, we have the potential to build systems like that. That's awesome. And if I start a new project today, should I use Zach or Arc? Uh, yeah, I'll say it depends on like what you, I mean, it depends on preference. If you like a pre, pre-made library like Radix UI or like, I mean, or like if you're trying to get like a similar example, I just want to import the component and use the component. I don't care about anything else. Um, just use RQI because that gives you everything that you need. Um, but if you're trying to be, say, like a design system, um, and you want to be in control of literally all the decisions, Say you have a big company, a slightly big team, you guys have, you have the resources, you want to actually, you don't want to build the logic, of course, but you want to actually take control of like how the components are named, um, or how the props are named or how the things work. Like, if you, then you, you have, you can go low level with that JS because what we do is just, it just like with RQI is take away all the decisions from you. Just like we just make a pretty reasonable decision for like the naming of the components, the naming of the props and all the things like we just make those things ahead of time for you and you're good to go. But if you want control, I think developers somewhat like control at some point, right? So like <laughs> if you're a type of person that you like, you like to want to control all the things, um, then of course, ZachJS is your, is your pick in that sense. Great. And is Arc already used in the Chakra UI or not? Not yet. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, Arc would power Chakra UI V3. Um, Chakra V3 actually is already, I mean, we have a pre-release oh, already great. for Chakra V3. Um, and a pre-release uses RQI. I mean, the goal of Chakra is like, I just want to delete all of the logic code in Chakra and never have to maintain any of that again. Like Chakra should just purely be the UI stuff, right? That's it. Not the logic okay. bit and stuff. So I just like take all of the, nice goodies from RQI and combine that with Chakra and the style prop system. And that's it, you're good to go. Um, that, that's how we build Chakra, right? So, I mean, of course, we're looking forward to releasing that pretty soon. Um, maybe when this video is out, it will be released already, but like we are looking forward to getting that out. That's awesome. And where can we find more information about uh, Zag and Chakra? Zag, of course, is zagjs.com. Um, you can you can go there to see like all the info. RQI is also there, rqi.com. Um, you see like all the, um, you, you probably be able to see when you look at the code snippets between zagjs and RQ, you see what we talk about um, when we say like we try to make the experience a lot easier. Um, and then Chakra, of course, is pretty much the chakraui.com you see. 
Um, you see like the current version of Chakra, but the next one is also coming out pretty soon. Great. And where can we um, see more information about you, Sage, on your website maybe? Yeah, my website, um, it's a pretty long domain name, adebayoshegna.com, but you can also search for me on Twitter, Sage, um, Shegna Adebayo as well. Um, you see me everywhere. Um, and you should, you should be, at least Twitter is a pretty common place to find me. Yeah. On Twitter, maybe too? Yeah, Twitter, yes, Shegna Adebayo, that's it. Yeah. Great. Thank you a lot for all, uh, all this information about State Machine, Zag, and Chakra. Thank you for your time. And uh, I hope to talk about you when Chakra UI uh, version 3 is released. <laughs> oh, yeah, Thank of you. course. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Sage. Bye. Yeah. X-State in the wild. Learn how experts use X-State.